Good evening, everyone, and, and welcome to today's session of Past Imperfect, which is brought to you by the Center for Wisdom and Leadership with, um, at SBJMR. Um, the center, uh, as many of you know, is, is, is relatively new, and uh, as a component of the center's work, what we're trying to do is, is bring in recent works on, uh, that relate to history, uh, this particular book, of course, has a much more contemporary focus and aspect, but it also does delve into some historical cases. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it helps us understand some of the, uh, the cases of perhaps we can say unwisdom, if we will, uh, certain cases um, in, in uh, you know, the recent past where Indians have uh, fled abroad India and Indian fugitives have been attempted to be brought back uh, to the country from Great Britain uh, through a process of extradition. Uh, the book uh, that we're going to discuss today has been written by Danish Khan and Ruhi Khan, uh, and they will be in conversation with both myself and my colleague here at SPJMR, Mihir Ajgankar. Uh, I'll briefly introduce both uh, Danish and Ruhi before they will give a brief presentation, and then after that, we'll have uh, some questions that both Mihir and I will ask uh, the, the authors, and then we'll open it up to general uh, question and answers. Uh, so Danish Khan is uh, both a journalist and a historian, uh, living in London. Uh, he has been, uh, you know, in his journalistic capacities, uh, covering uh, items in the UK and Europe, the Times Now, ET Now, the Mumbai Mirror. Uh, he was, uh, he's in his capacity as, a, as an academic, uh, in which I've been able to, to, to know him. Uh, he is a PhD candidate at uh, the University of Oxford, where he's, he's writing a, a dissertation on uh, a topic related to Indian capitalism. Um, he has uh, taught history courses at Oxford and also at Stanford University. Ruhi Khan uh, is based in London and is an independent journalist, uh, and she covers UK for the Mojo story uh, and has written cases, uh, written stories on extradition cases for The Wire, uh, and previously has worked with NDTV, uh, Mumbai Mirror, uh, and she was also a curator with Twitter UK. Uh, she was a Jefferson Fellow with the East West Center in the United States um, and a recipient of the Mary Morgan Hewitt Award for Women in Journalism. Uh, she's currently an Economic and Social Research Council researcher at LSC in London, and she edits the media at LSC blog. Uh, so without further ado, I'll ask uh, both uh, Danish and Ruby if you can uh, give your presentation, and we look forward to what you have to say. Thank you very much, Dinyar, for inviting us. It's, uh, it's an honor to speak uh, here. So. Uh, uh, just getting straight on into our, our presentation. So as you said, our book is about uh, basically extradition cases that India pursued uh, uh, in the United Kingdom, which has got a lot of traction and uh, we'll come to uh, the cases uh, and why and how India pursued these people. And what does it tell us about uh, Indian capitalism? What does it tell us about diplomacy, foreign policy, and also the rule of law and how uh, India and UK sat, sit down, sat down together to weave uh, 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 the extradition treaty. So all of that uh, are some of the major points that we have covered in our book. Uh, but basically the question was that why is it that Indian fugitives go uh, to the United Kingdom? And uh, if we speak about who all are there in the book for future, uh, you can see this uh, timeline we have made, some familiar faces, of course, some not so familiar, but what ties them all is how they use the laws uh, to uh, you know, escape to the United Kingdom and then of course use it as a base to try and frustrate India's attempt to get them back. Uh, so these cases range from the current famous cases of Vijay Mahalia and Nirav Modi uh, to music director Nadeem Saifi and underworld kingpin uh, Iqbal Mirchi uh, uh, to the 50s as well, where we had a Indian capitalist perhaps, uh, uh, you know, who became very rich by virtue of contracting uh, and how he escaped to the United Kingdom. So we have uh, done our book in a, uh, you know, not really branched out into, into particular sections, but if you look at who all feature, there is financial crime, which forms a huge part of our book. And some of the names are there, Vijay Mali, of course, Nirav Modi, both of them are very much here in the United Kingdom. CBI and ED are pursuing them because of the huge financial fraud that they did. Uh, Dharma Jayanti Teja, again, was a very famous name from the 1960s, who started India's first private shipping empire, uh, you know, with the help of, of Nehru, uh, who he impressed 
upon giving money uh, to his enterprise. And that was a huge case which happened here in the United Kingdom. Uh, Mubarak Ali Ahmed, again, as I said, was an army contractor. He made millions supplying provisions uh, during the Second World War. But the CDR, the, the, they also represent the underbelly about how they frauded or defrauded people and, uh, and shareholders and conned them into giving them money only to use them unwisely, uh, if I may say so. Uh, so that's one aspect which we look into uh, much detail about the financial crimes. Then uh, the second uh, uh, category that we can look upon is terrorism in, and espionage again. So we have Iqbal Mirchi again. Uh, nobody knew that he had such a big empire that he was building all through these decades. He's, he's dead now, but the enforcement directorate is still pursuing his family, his sons, and has uncovered a huge trail of uh, alleged money laundering and how he made those investments in the real estate. Uh, so that's Iqbal Mirchi, who was also pursued here unsuccessfully by India. Then we have Ravi Shankar, again, another example of, uh, you know, capitalism gone wrong, perhaps because he started a huge uh, uh, company for, uh, for arms uh, dealers and, and was facilitating the investment into India by arms companies and of, also, of course, was uh, accused of, of trading in India's secrets. Uh, then we have Terror Tiger, Hanif Tiger Patel, who was uh, accused in the Surat blast case. But now, of course, he's a free man here because uh, he made his case convincing that if he goes back to India, he will be subject to, uh, to torture. So his extradition was barred on human rights grounds. So terrorism and espionage, again, another important component uh, that we have. Uh, we also have another category, which is, again, as I said, reflects the underbelly of, of Indian society. Uh, we have Narang brothers who were very famous uh, of, uh, in, in that period. They were into Bollywood. They were into, uh, into horse uh, racing, but they were also into uh, smuggling, which was a huge business in those days in the 70s and 80s. Uh, that, that was also the period when the Privy Purse was ended, and a lot of royal families uh, were trying to cash in the uh, artifacts and the sculptures that they had. So uh, people like the Narang brothers, that's what the dossier says, facilitated the uh, departure of a lot of artifacts from India outside uh, uh, in the international market. So our book figures uh, about Narang brothers, how they raised their empire, they went into hospitality, into film financing, but of course, how India pursued them here in the United Kingdom uh, to uh, make them answerable for uh, the uh, smuggling of, of, of artifacts worth crores of rupees. Sanjeev Chawla, again, a blot uh, that has come here to stay with the world of sport and cricket match fixing and betting took India by storm uh, over the last few decades. So we have the story of Sanjeev Chawla again, how India pursued here in the United Kingdom, what were the arguments they put forward, and how they ultimately got him back uh, to New Delhi. Nadim Sefi, again, a very famous name. It was a case that shook the nation. We all remember how Gulshan Kumar was shot uh, in cold-blooded uh, murder. It was on the streets of Andheri. Uh, Nadim Sefi was named as a key accused in that case, and it was said that he was connected with the underworld. Uh, and then, of course, he stayed put in the United Kingdom. And what was the story behind it? What were the arguments that India made and how, uh, you know, India won the case first and then they lost? Uh, tells us a lot about the way Indian agencies go after, uh, uh, you know, fugitives and what were the lessons that India learned, perhaps. So murder, match fixing and murti smuggling, as you can see, we've tried to make it a bit of a Bollywood dash. Uh, then we have these gruesome cases about crimes against uh, children. Uh, uh, you know, we had this uh, case of this couple, uh, Arti Dheer and Kabal Raizada, who were accused of uh, adopting an, an orphan in Gujarat and then allegedly ordering uh, his murder so that they could pocket the insurance money. Again, a kind of a financial crime, but, but gruesome details, uh, of course. They are now free because India was unable to give certain documents and the British courts set them free. We also have the case of Raymond Varley again, it was like a, uh, you know, a Charles Sobraj kind of a character. He's constantly moving from UK to Thailand, to Goa, to different parts of Africa uh, in different avatars. So we tracked him down, uh, his case uh, also, and how he's also a free man here, but again, involved 
uh, in, in, in pedophile crimes in Goa. He is a convicted pedophile, having served prison terms here in the United Kingdom in the 70s. But India was unable to get him again uh, because of some technicalities. So, uh, uh, you know, these, this is again, uh, uh, as I said, was very painful part for us to write because we uh, went through court documents and, and tried to figure out how their defense lawyer made their case up so that they could escape uh, facing the law in India. Uh, so crimes against children, against these two, as I said, very gruesome uh, uh, details uh, were there. Uh, the next slide is now about, so why UK is, ex is exactly a haven for these people? All these kind of people have escaped to UK. Some of them, like Raymond Wale, was a British citizen, but Ruhi will take forward from here and, and uh, look into the gist about why UK has emerged as this kind of a favorite uh, you know, destination for fugitives. Thanks, Danish. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for having us here. I've got a horrid cough, but I hope it's not too much of a nuisance when I speak. Uh, so please bear with me. Of course, we thought with the Pandora papers that have just been out that we will look at this one aspect of the UK and why it um, sort of advertises itself as this you know, like one of the MPs here mentioned that UK has a for sale sign on it. So it's sort of advertising itself as a safe haven for a lot of people who want to park uh, ill-gotten money from their countries into real estate here. And also probably find an escape route out of whatever legal tangles they get into their own countries. So obviously the location of the United Kingdom has always, always been their trump card. It's very centrally located. It's closer to several countries in Asia, Europe, US. Um, so the location serves as a great motivator to move to the UK. Also, it is a very rich country. It's tiny compared to India, but it's super rich. There are about one in 10 dollar millionaires. So these are people that have uh, properties worth 720,000 pounds at least. There are over 100 billionaires and 5,000 super rich people. And uh, by super rich, we mean that they have 20 million plus in disposable assets, not property, but disposable assets. So that's a lot of money um, this country has and it draws people with that kind of money. And obviously, in terms of India, there is that colonial connection. There's always been a link with the United Kingdom. There's always been an easy transfer of people between the two countries. And that has carried on even after independence. UK has a very multicultural lifestyle, so you can easily feel at home, especially in cities like London, if you are from another country. So it has multi-cuisine, it has theaters, the West End is here. It's really rich in all kinds of cultural forms. Um, it's also very easy on immigration. And with that, I do not mean uh, the commoners. They might, it might not be that easy for them. Although it's still opening up for students now and giving them an opportunity to stay back. But for people with money, it's fairly easy to sort of buy a citizenship here if you come through the golden visas which we can talk a little bit in detail uh, when we have questions on that. But yeah, it is quite an easy route to migrate to the UK, especially for the super rich. People who are escaping the law in their country, UK's legal system has a, puts a lot of emphasis on human rights. So, um, they, so that helps in many ways to uh, make a strong argument for those that are trying to seek refuge in this country. And obviously, rule of law takes an sort of importance in the courts here. So if you do not um, adhere to the relevant rules that have been put forth, the documents that the law ask, um, you, are, you can easily get away. So that is something that a lot of people bank on to be able to stay in this country. Just... Okay, so Pandora Papers, uh, you can see that the Pandora Papers do mention a lot of people in the UK, um, including the famous Blairs in the way they bought their property. Of course, a lot of Indian names have also cropped up. Uh, Harish Salve's name came up, I think just yesterday uh, in, with the property that he bought in the UK. But this is just about 4 billion worth of property that has come out in the Pandora Papers. 
UK has 170 billion worth of property that is actually owned offshore. And with offshore, uh, one of the highest contenders is BVI, the British Virgin Islands. And uh, uh, and you can also see like one in four of the people that have been named in the Pandora leaks are UK citizens, and many of these have actually become UK citizens through the golden visa route. So they were not born here, but they were super rich people from other countries that came here and got the UK citizenship through this golden visa route. So how does this work? Um, it's very simple. You set up an anonymous shell company in a secret offshore location, like the British Virgin Island, the St. Kitts, there's Nevis, all of those provide uh, really good places to set up offshore accounts and offshore companies. You transfer your money into this offshore company. Obviously, you do not have to disclose details of where you got the money. So if you defraud a country, that's the money that you can park in there. And then you can use those companies to buy property in the UK. And that's how you get a super luxury home in this country. Or you can sell a company off to someone legit and then convert your money into white money and successfully manage to launder your money. And because this is between two companies and not individuals, it's easy to escape certain taxes that you would pay on properties here, like the stamp duty tax. Um, so my purpose in saying all of this is not to help you do that or to advocate something like this, but this is an important issue. It is um, not necessarily illegal, but it is definitely, definitely unethical. And so it's important to take a look at this. Um, there are lots of companies that make a lot of money trying to set up these companies and they get away with it because there's no law that prohibits that. And the reason we wanted to talk about this a little bit more is because of Vijay Malia. And before the Pandora paper leaks, we did dig up quite a bit on uh, how Vijay Malia bought his properties here. And obviously his name does not figure in the Pandora leaks, but the, the modus operandi is pretty much similar. He bought this property that you can see in the picture uh, from Anthony Hamilton. His son, Louis Hamilton, is quite famous. Um, he's the race car driver. Um, and uh, this property is two buildings, Lady Walk and Bramble Lodge, and lots of uh, different outhouses that adorn this 30-acre property. Um, there's swimming pools, there are tennis courts, there are several garages that have very, very fancy cars. I do want you guys to pay a little bit of attention to the address on the screen. Uh, it's useful when I tell you how he bought this property. And so um, this is how it happened. On 11 June, which Amalia visited this property, this property was already on the market uh, through one of these uh, estate agents, uh, Savills and I Frank, which only, only look at uh, uh, super expensive properties in the country. And it seems they also had one person who was interested in the property. But the minute Malia saw this property, he made an offer and a written agreement was signed. This agreement was signed between Malia and uh, Anthony Hamilton. So Malia's name is on that written agreement. He signed it on behalf of his children, but there's no evidence that his children were at the property or had agreed for him to sign on their behalf. But what happened was following that, <coughs> sorry, on 25th Jan in 2015, he established these two companies, Wellwyn Property Trust and Tuwin Property Trust. And this is where I get you back into the address. His address had both Wellwyn and Tuwin mentioned on that. So he just picked up those names and he created these uh, shell companies in BVI in British Virgin Islands. And uh, another company called Lady Walk was established again um, there. And a Swiss-based company, CASL, which is an accounting firm, became a trustee for all these companies, these shell companies, including Saleda Trust, which is Malia's family trust. So this um, accounting company based in uh, Switzerland was acting as a trustee for these shell companies that were created solely with the intention of buying this property. So the funds were transferred to Lady Walk Investments, 
And then Lady Walk Investment or Lady Walk LLP purchased Lady Walk and Bramble Lodge properties for 12 million pounds. And then when Malia escaped India in March 2016, he made this his UK home. So that's how these properties are bought. That's how it's easy to park fund that does not need to be accounted for. And this is something like I mentioned is not illegal, but highly unethical, a very uh, great way to launder money. And uh, UK is still open to high net worth investors. And this definitely serves as an escape from laws in any other country. So with that, thank you everyone. And we are open to questions. Thank you very much, Danish and, and, and Ruhi, uh, for that presentation. And I'd encourage attendees to uh, ask questions. You can write your questions in the Q and A box. Uh, so, you know, as as both authors mentioned, this is this is a really relevant topic to talk about right now, right? I mean, in light of the Pandora Papers, and uh, especially, and you know, if we go back a little bit further to the Panama Papers, I mean, we've had a huge expose of uh, how this particular aspect of the cap capitalist society we live in works, right? In the sense that uh, you have all these super rich people who are able to park and uh, utilize money in in ways that, as Ruby mentioned, are not illegal, but are definitely unethical, right? And you know, London is is a great place, I think, to really talk about this because you know, as anyone who's visited or, in your case, has lived in London, uh, you know that Indians are only just one part of the equation, right? I mean, you have Russian billionaires, you have Saudi billionaires. I, 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 I think what it's urban legend, or maybe it's true that there's a, a row of houses by Regent's Park, which are completely empty that are owned by, uh, you know, either guys from the UAE or, or, or Saudi Arabia. I mean, you have these large buildings that are relatively empty, but are used to, to kind of hold cash. So it's, it's really become a systemic feature in uh, our modern economy with the UK being kind of a front and center in this particular aspect of it. So one question I want to ask you, um, and you know, both Mihira and I will, will ask you one or two questions and then hopefully we can get more uh, Q and A's from the, the audience in general is, um, what is the sheer number of fugitive Indian businessmen? And I know in your book, you've talked about more than just businessmen, obviously, but what is the sheer number of Indian uh, fugitive businessmen? Tell us about Indian capitalism uh, and business. Uh, do you feel that India is somewhat unique in being in the situation where so many really high profile uh, business leaders uh, eventually flee um, and, you know, go through multi year processes of, of litigating the way in order to make sure that they stay in, in the UK on return to India? Uh, yes, I mean, Dinya, so we attended the court cases very, very closely. In fact, Vijay Malia's case, for example, was uh, not just about the person, then the defense and the prosecution went at great details to uh, impress upon the court the nature of airline business in India. And it seems that, I mean, and going by, by the center uh, that is hosting us today, it was a very unwise decision of Vijay Malia to uh, you know, go into the airline industry. And, and that was one uh, thing that his defense kept on saying that the aviation industry in India, the dynamics of the aviation industry in India is such that a lot of that is uh, outside the scope of the, uh, of the industry or the people who are part of that industry. It is about the government's uh, role. It's about international uh, uh, fuel prices and other factors. So what we got a sense was that it's so important to keep the shareholders value at heart and try and understand uh, to do things that will be best for the shareholders and for the investors, because it's also uh, a huge issue of ethics. Now, it's, it's also not very easy. Uh, Vijay Malia himself also invested a lot of money. That was his argument that he gave personal guarantee as well, because he believed in that industry and that he wanted the aviation industry to take off. And, and, and as Kingfisher, he uh, thought that that was a vehicle that will revolutionize the Indian skies. But that's not exactly what happened. And it seems that he invested a lot of money without uh, make, taking a long-term view. I mean, that's the sense that we got hearing both the sides. But as far as London is concerned, uh, Daniel, you are absolutely right. It's, so India has won the extradition case, but Vijay Malia is still very much here in the United Kingdom. So why is it? Well, there are a host of reasons, but what is the end result? Well, India has won at the trial court with the and at the high court as well, but uh, Indian capitalist 
still remains just the same as the case for uh, for 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 Modi, Nirav Modi again. He took money from the Punjab National Bank without uh, you know giving security for those huge uh, letters of take undertaking that he got. Again, it showed India in a very poor light and 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 showed that how easy it is to uh, defraud the system. Uh, and then they are all here in the United Kingdom, who has given them sanctuary or at least has made it difficult for India to get them back. Great, Danish, uh, you know, very uh, great explanation. Uh, I have next question uh, for you uh, regarding the same case. Uh, you know, uh, we, we, your book ends uh, with a reference that uh, Mr. Malia's application uh, is pending before the Home Secretary in United Kingdom, right? Now, is there any time limit for a Home Secretary to decide in this case? And uh, whether any idea if government of India using any diplomatic leverage with the British government to ensure his uh, extradition so that we can see him standing trial in the country. <laughs> right. So what has happened here, as I said, was India has won in the British courts, but he has made an asylum application. That's what we understand. And that goes before the Home Secretary. Uh, there is no defined uh, limit for the Home Secretary to make a decision. But what I understand is then after the Home Secretary makes the decision, it is again uh, subject to a judicial intervention. So either party, the Home Secretary or Vijay Malia himself can then appeal uh, in the uh, immigration tribunal here. And then he can further appeal to the upper tri tribunal and then it can go to the high court again. So there is still another aspect, another layer of, of, of judicial uh, intervention that is there. So there is no timeline to answer your question and because the law doesn't specify. And also uh, London, as I said, is a city where they, you get refugees from all over the world and the Home Office has to look through those cases. There is a caseworker who is assigned to each of those applications who has to sit and see what are the arguments that the applicant has made and then whether it's correct and then you know apply all those rules. So it's a, it's a never ending process. But there's also a possibility that a decision is taken and we are not made aware of it because if it's an asylum case, then the uh, UK government will say that it's a confidential uh, application and only the applicant will know. So perhaps uh, Vijay Male has already got an asylum. We can't be very sure. Quite interesting. Yeah, I, I think you make an important point that, you know, London has been for a very long period of, of time, a, a place where people have fled to. Uh, you know, I, I, I recently read uh, a book by Linda Colley, the, the, the British historian in, in, in Princeton on, uh, Indian, on, on the development of constitutions worldwide. And she pointed out that, you know, if you were an exile in the 1800s from a place like, say, South America, or of course, France or such, you went to London. Uh, so much so that, you know, uh, most of the, 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 the leaders of, of countries in South America actually lived in London for short periods of time. Now, now these were individuals who probably weren't involved in, uh, you know, financial fraud and such, but still London has had this longer history of, of being a place of refuge, whether it's economic or political or what have you. Um, the question I'm going to ask you is, uh, again, more, more, more moored in the present, which is, uh, you know, throughout your book, you get a real sense that the government of India has... Uh, shown startling incompetence uh, in many cases in prosecuting these cases uh, when, when, it, when, in the, when in Great Britain, at least, right? And in the sense that you talk about how judges have thrown out particular uh, aspects of evidence or have expressed frustration uh, with uh, you know, incomplete evidence or things not filed properly. Why has the government of India managed to bungle the job so badly uh, in the past and, and has it learned its, its lessons? Well, that's a very interesting question, Dinyar. Um, but uh, the government of India not uh, did not mess up all the time. I mean, when we looked at the older cases, we saw a remarkable success rate, uh, which was something that actually got us into researching more into the historical cases because recent trend before Malia's conviction uh, or before Malia's extradition was okayed was that India was losing cases one after the other and for really silly reasons, like not submitting documents at time or not making uh, enough of a prima facie case, which is one of the requisites of uh, seeking extradition that they have to prove that there's enough case 
for the people to answer if they are sent back to India. So the government bungled up a lot on that in terms of the charge sheet that they filed or the corroborated evidence that they presented. But earlier in the older cases, they did manage to get people back and get some really powerful people back like the Narang brothers or Teja. But then there was this period in between, like when we saw with Nadine, Nadine's case was a disaster. So much so that um, the CPS lawyer, actually in the House of Lords a few years later, said that he was in fact glad that Nadine was let out. So he was the one representing India. So he was the one privy to all the case or the nuances of the case that India had brought forward for Nadim Sefi. And he was the one who said that he was actually glad that Nadim managed to get out because there was really no case for him to answer. So that talks about how um, terrible India's, um, India's defense was in, to get him back. And we also saw that with uh, the others with Wali, uh, India did not raise the issue of re-examining him. He made a claim that he has dementia, which got him off the hook. Uh, but India did not make any request to get him tested by their own or by a neutral medical practitioner, which was one of the reasons India lost the case. And very recently with the couple that adopted the child and allegedly murdered him for insurance, all India had to do was send an assurance saying that the laws in Gujarat that would not give them parole uh, would be re-looked at in their case in particular. And India did not send that document on time, which is why they were let off. So there are these glaring examples of how India messed up really simple things in you know, the way they carried out these cases. Um, which could have changed the fate of the cases. And that is something that India needs to really pull up its boots and look at, especially the prosecuting agencies and the way they carry out these cases. But having said that, Anir Modi and Malia's trials were a treat to watch. Every uh, argument that was made in court, every demand made by the court, uh, the agencies made sure that they adhered to it. Uh, so yeah, so you know the agencies can do a really good job if they put their minds to it, but they can also simply let the case crumble if they have no interest in it. Superb. Uh, I have one general question. Uh, you know, uh, it, uh, I, as I went through the book, one argument that has been uniformly uh, put across in the courts by most of these fugitives is that uh, they are not going to enjoy the prisoners' rights in Indian prisons as what uh, the prisoners enjoy in United Kingdom. You know, uh, a few years ago, I had read uh, Mr. Uh, Jeffrey Archer's book, The Prison Diary, and there he talks about certain prisons in United Kingdom. Uh, which are very notorious for the uh, safety and security of the prisoners, right? So, uh, you know, uh, don't you think that uh, it's, it's an argument that is being put forward and the courts are accepting it uh, without also looking at the situation in the ground in United Kingdom? Uh, because in any developing country, you may have a situation where the jails are overcrowded. They are not going to get uh, the, uh, the treatment or the services that uh, uh, the prisoners in a developed countries really enjoy. And uh, by using this argument on prisoners' rights, uh, the uh, people who have actually stolen from the, uh, the citizens of these countries are they are getting scots free and they are living as free citizens in the United Kingdom. Yes, Mihir, uh, I mean, absolutely. So that is one of the key arguments that, that they make in the, in the courts here. And that's primarily because there are certain bars to extradition and, uh, uh, and human rights is one of the reasons that uh, could be used to stop a person being extradited from the United Kingdom. And that means the condition that he or she uh, will face in an Indian prison. So that is understandable that they will definitely use that argument, they will use that as a defense. Uh, but what has exactly happened is, as per the extradition law and the treaty that is being signed, uh, they have to upheld uh, certain rights of the, of the con convicts or the people who have to be sent back. So they do raise this issue of, of jail conditions. 
but what has now also evolved rather is that the requesting state, India or any other state, can make an assurance to the court and say that this particular prisoner who we are seeking to be extradited will be put in this particular cell and we will ensure that these are the facilities that he or she will get. So by doing that, what essentially is happening is uh, the courts understand that there are cultural and economic differences and the prison systems will be different. Uh, but as long as the requesting state gives an assurance that meets the criteria, they will not stop a person from being extradited. So Vijay Malia used this uh, uh, defense so did Nirav Modi, but the uh, CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service representing India gave assurances and video deta uh, details of the cell where they will be kept and assured the courts that their human rights will not be breached because unlike the wider prison population, we will ensure that this is what they are uh, getting, uh, they will get access to. So it has been used both ways, but as, I, but as you said, that there have been a lot of cases where the fugitives have been able to get away using the prison argument. But at the same time, India has been giving assurances uh, from a particular bureaucrat the, uh, uh, or the jail authority saying that uh, this is what we will give and that will ensure that the human rights are, are not breached. So, uh, you know, India and other requesting states are, are using the instrument of assurance to, uh, to uh, ensure that they get the extradition done. Yeah, absolutely right. And this is also something that is new. We've seen this uh, with Sanjeev Chawla's case. He won uh, in the lower court on this very same argument that the jail conditions in India are terrible and would uh, bar his human rights. But when the case went into the high court, the court accepted the assurance. And so he was sent back. So these assurances are actually working brilliantly in India's favor. And it is something that is now getting widely accepted in the UK courts. So one of the main defenses that fugitives had all these wilds, which was the jail conditions in India, uh, seem to no longer hold as much uh, power as it did earlier. That's a pretty significant development then, because I mean, you know, we, we've, we've heard of Indian prison conditions being used as um, an excuse for, for such a long period of time, right, for any case of extradition. Um, and you know what I found remarkable was that you know you noted in your book that many other fugitives have put the same argument uh, before courts in Great Britain uh, for you know against extradition to countries like Greece, right? I mean, obviously, Greece and the United Kingdom are no longer fellow members of the EU, but at one point in time they were, and it's quite remarkable that here you have a case of you know potentially a Greek fugitive saying that I can't go back to Greece because of supposedly bad uh, prison conditions. Um, I want to ask one question and then we'll get to, uh, to, to audience, audience question and answers. And, and my question goes, uh, again, back to kind of a more London-centric perspective. Uh, so, you know, for any of us who study leaders or leadership, you know, we, we, we talk and, and, you know, write a lot about networks, right? I mean, you know, the people around you and, and the connections around you that, that facilitate your, your development and growth. And I wonder if there's kind of a perverse example of this uh, that you've uh, uncovered uh, while looking at, at these particular individuals, whether just limited to Indian fugitives, you know, is a Malia talking to, is someone in the Malia camp talking to someone in the, uh, in the Modi camp, uh, or even more broadly uh, with, you know, these particular rogues gallery, if you will, uh, of, you know, people who are Russian or, or Saudi or, or, you know, UAE or, or what have you, um, you know, are they talking to each other? Are, uh, you know, their lawyers talking to each other to kind of share strategy and, you know, uh, think about how best to harness the legal system in the UK uh, to their advantage. I'm sure there's a really uh, good business that actually does that in the UK. Um, the consultants have probably, you know, set this up as a very high uh, price uh, service that they provide. But we do know Malia and Modi's uh, solicitor is the same. Um, so there's obviously a lot of sharing of know-how there. We also know that uh, they have to keep updated on all kinds of cases of extradition that happen here. They're often cited in the courts, but they're also very closely looked at. Um, so Assange, Julian Assange's case, which is very different to Nirav Modi's case, is going to be a very interesting template for uh, Modi's team to look at because Julian Assange also raised the issue of mental health, which would be a very powerful argument uh, 
in need of Modi's case. And he is making that when the case goes into uh, the high court. So that, that will also be something that his team is going to follow extremely closely. Of course, it's UK and like I mentioned, how many billionaires live here, they do meet. Um, there are loads of places like this. Annabelle, which is frequented a lot by Modi, would see several of these people who have cases against them also frequent that uh, high end club. So there is always going to be a sort of uh, meeting place for uh, high net worth individuals from across the world. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's a lot of uh, sharing of ideas, if you may like, on that front. And also, uh, extradition is a very busy uh, is a very busy part of of the law here, and uh, you know it's it's a mini industry. Uh, there are some very highly sought after lawyers and and uh, and legal firms that specialize in extradition, and so. You know, if you go to the uh, to the Westminster Magistrate Court on a day when extradition hearings are there, you will see the list, the public list, and Poland, U.S., Australia, uh, France, Italy, uh, UAE, you name it, and there will be a case about uh, you know people from those countries who are being sought from the United Kingdom. So it's a very busy, very lucrative practice, but it's also very evolving. Uh, uh, you know, if I may say, uh, uh, area of law, fascinating because there, as I said, there is a combination of factors: foreign policy, international law, uh, diplomacy, behind the scenes arguments, and also, of course, the rule of law. So it's not that uh, people are coming here because you know they can get away, but also because the judiciary here is highly evolved. They do take it very seriously: the separation of the judiciary and the executive, and they want to ensure that the rule of law is met. So you know, there won't be underhand dealings, for example, as, as seems to have alleged in the case of certain countries in the Middle East, that's not a possibility. But diplomacy does play a role. And as I said, it's a lucrative practice. And uh, yeah, the lawyers and the practitioners are, are in very close contact with each other. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, so uh, let's get to some audience questions. Um, and, and this particular question, which I'll read out, uh, is, is, is related to what uh, you were talking about. Uh, it's it's asking about you know is is this just the case for India where you have all these um, you know individuals who are you know fleeing the law? Is it is it is it to do something with weak Indian law? Uh, you know what what you know the, the individual uses the word rogues. Uh, what what you know could you tell us a bit more about you know these individuals from other parts of the world in in, in London and and again how how these Indian fugitives fit into a broader picture of what's going on in London. So as I said, it's it's a very lucrative practice. There have been other countries as well, uh, who uh, you know perhaps come much more under the under the scan of. So U.S. for example, Juruhi just spoke about Julian Assange. Then we had a very interesting case about a young boy who had uh, who had some uh, mental issues, and he was sought by the U.S. on charges of uh, uh, of. Um, um, uh, uh, of, of some crimes uh, on the internet. And that created a huge flutter because he was very young and uh, there was a huge campaign here in the press to ensure that he doesn't go back to US because uh, that will breach his human rights and that he could be tried here in the UK itself rather than being sent across to US because uh, the crime, alleged crime was committed here. So, I mean, what I'm trying to come at is there are huge number of cases. We had the case of another uh, Pakistani national who was a drug lord, uh, alleged drug lord who was sought by the US. Uh, and uh, he won his case because the FBI then dropped the case against him completely. So he managed to stay back and then now he's back in Pakistan. Similarly, Turkey, there have been cases of media moguls from Turkey who have sought uh, asylum here in the uh, United Kingdom saying that if they go back to Turkey, they will be prosecuted, they will be uh, you know, uh, targeted by the regime and the courts have accepted. Russia again, we get a fair share of people from uh, Russia 
who resist the extradition saying that the Russian authorities are doing that because they just want to get even at us and they want to uh, uh, you know, make us uh, uh, a target. So the courts declined those uh, requests as well here saying that yes, the fugitive has, the requested person, rather I must use the word instead of fugitive, the requested person has made a case to not being extradited. So you have all these cases. The issue with India, Dinya, to answer the question is that there is a requirement of a prima facie case. So when a request is made by India, the Indian authorities through the CPS have to convince the court that there is a prima facie case for the requested person to answer. Now that is different uh, to the European nations who do not have to prove a prima facie case. Uh, there are other grounds on which they are sought. So that is a very key uh, difference. And uh, to establish that prima facie case, essentially you have a mini trial that takes place in the UK itself. Great, thank you. I'll, I'll just make one housekeeping note before uh, we get to our next question. Um, you know, if you have a question, please put the, the question in the Q&A box. Uh, I, I see a, a hand raised. Uh, we, we, we can't take uh, uh, questions like that. So just type it out in, in the box, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there is one other interesting question. You know, uh, is, there, uh, is there some kind of a collusion between uh, these people who are uh, running away to United Kingdom and uh, the local politicians or various government agencies in those countries. Uh, in how come these people are actually allowed to leave their, uh, their respective countries to go to UK? And uh, whether how the immigration authorities in UK are allowing these people to enter the country? Well, I think uh, it's a very good question. And uh, it is something that uh, we should be asking a lot more because how are these people escaping? You know, it's not like they escaped in the middle of the night. It's they take flights, um, things are recorded. They are not, um, you know, like with, with Jamalia, it was claimed that he left with 300 bags. Now that does not really make him invisible. Okay, and it's with Jamalia, everyone knows him. So there, could be collusion. Uh, Vijay Malia has also said that he uh, spoke to Jet Li before he left, telling him that he was going to leave. Um, we also begin our book with the case of Jet Airways uh, director, the Goyals, and how they were stopped. So it is quite possible to stop people from leaving the country if you bring in your checks and balances and put them in place. Um, so there could be collusion. There could be, uh, uh, you know, like, Maybe uh, the, the agencies are not doing a very good job or uh, not being vigilant enough. But these are questions that should be raised because UK has been looked at as this place where people can easily escape to. And it's not that far. People have made several trips. A lot of businessmen um, have properties in the UK. So they have already established UK as a second home. And you can clearly see that with uh, thanks to Instagram, I think a lot of them post pictures of their UK homes and their holidays in the UK. So you do know that they have a place to go to if they decide to leave India. UK becomes one of those destinations that is very high up on the list. So it's pretty easy to keep an eye on that. Uh, we did see that uh, with uh, very recently with Shilpa Shetty's husband, Raj Kundra, his bail was opposed on the grounds that he would escape to the UK. Um, so I do think that this is something that investigating agencies should keep an eye out for. And also the media and the public should probably be a little bit more aware when they see uh, especially public figures in airports and other places where they could easily escape from. And Mihir, just to quickly add a bit, I couldn't stop myself. So this case of uh, uh, Dharma Jayanti Teja that we speak, uh, you know, it's very clear that actually he was a fugitive who owed the taxman a lot of money and he was taken to the airport by the son of a former prime minister and a cabinet minister, Sikandar Bak, who actually took him there to Delhi airport from where he escaped. And uh, unfortunately what happened is the flight that he took the airline, the airline was then taken to task by the taxman saying that, how come you allowed him to fly when he was on a no-fly list? This is 
of the 70s I'm talking about. And the airline then says, well, what do you expect our employees to do? You have the prime minister's son and the industries minister escorting him to the airport. And you are saying that we should decline him uh, a seat when uh, you know he's coming with, with all these uh, senior public figures. So collusion at some level is definitely there. And uh, uh, yes, I mean, how else will they escape from, from India? Yeah, these, these networks are kind of revelatory of, you know, just how closely entwined politics and economics and business are here in India, right? It's in many ways very unique, right? I mean, we've, we've, we've heard discussion of how, you know, tax terrorism is being used today. Uh, and these examples you see are how, I guess, you know, the wheels are greased on the other end, right, to facilitate uh, certain individuals uh, with the ability to escape uh, if they're politically connected. Uh, we have an audience question. Uh, what happened with Lalit Modi? Uh, what is the status of his case? Again, very interesting. And it's very startling to say that when we began the book, Lalit Modi was going to figure in, but then we found out that there is no extradition request against Lalit Modi. So he is not a fugitive uh, in the technical sense. Uh, there was also, we realized a lot of behind the scenes things that happened and uh, which led to no formal request being sent to UK. So unless a request is sent to United Kingdom, they can't start the, uh, uh, the process of extradition on, on their own. Uh, so from what we understand, I think he's very much a, a UK national, I think, uh, because he got some, uh, uh, some documents done earlier, which perhaps might have now led him to acquiring a UK uh, passport. But he's very much here in the United Kingdom, of course, uh, missing his cricket, I'm sure, but there is no extradition case against him, so he's a free man. He's kind of faded from the news uh, over the past few few years, which again shows you just how frequent this is, right? I mean, uh, you know, Nirav Modi today, Ladit Modi yesterday, what was before that? And I think, again, your book is, is, is good in that sense, right? And in talking about how there's so much more of a longer history uh, of, uh, you know, this, this, this issue of, of people fleeing abroad. Um, I have one question uh, in relation to that. You know, while, you, while you were researching this book, were there other major centers uh, which, you know, where, where people fled to, you know, specifically from places like India, uh, which, which you saw come up a lot in discussion? I mean, aside from London, uh, where else were people going to, or, you know, what were people discussing as possible other locations to either uh, park themselves or, or park their money? I think um, one of the destinations that probably came into most people's mind uh, are these little islands in the Caribbean where they can lose themselves and take all the money that they have with no questions answered. So we do know Nirav Modi was uh, looking for citizenship of this little island called Manatu. And uh, we also saw Teja uh, stayed in Costa Rica for a while. So that was also uh, something that um, came up. Um, with the others, with Malia, I don't think there was ever a reason for him to go into oblivion because Malia is a loud personality. He wants to be seen. He also wants to partake in all kinds of uh, uh, events and uh, luxuries that are afforded in a city like London. Uh, but yeah, I mean, smaller islands would serve as a good focal point. Uh, we saw that with uh, Nirav Modi's uncle who is hiding in Antigua. But then, you know, with what happened recently there and the kind of diplomatic pressure that India could probably bring those nations into, I think that might now be a little bit not on the list of places people would like to escape to because again, the rule of law there can easily be shaken up. Um, so, yeah. Also Middle East at one point was a very, was a very favorite destination. And I'm speaking about the 80s and the 90s when you had a lot of underworld uh, figures, a lot of criminals just going across to Dubai, which was such a convenient location. It was just two hours away from India uh, and no laws could touch you. And then you could also go to other countries, uh, Afghanistan or Pakistan or Iran and use that as a, as a sort of a, a center for your all kind of activities. 
that has taken a beating so far because of, uh, uh, in the last few years, we have seen a lot of people have been successfully extradited or India has managed to get them back. So that is perhaps no longer a destination that favored a destination, but it was at one point of time, simply because it was very close and also because they allowed you that much of leeway to do all those kind of activities and, and as a very convenient center to uh, you know, meet people and, and your business associates and all kind of uh, shady people from around the region. Uh, that has taken a beating. Uh, Europe is again there, you have few cases coming up there. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, London, we've realized has become this gateway because of this sheer number of people and also because there has been close links uh, in the past that we spoke about. All of that has helped make London a, a very favored destination. I'll, I'll just note, I mean, it's, it's fascinating as a historian to, to, to notice that all these old imperial connections are alive and well, right? I mean, Dubai, Vanuatu, Antigua, uh, you know, all parts of, I believe, you know, I believe all parts of the former British Empire, right? I mean, it's, uh, you know, imperialism survives in some new and unusual ways in, in our particular era. Uh, well, I just have a question and maybe it's uh, the last question that uh, we can consider because we are coming close to uh, six o'clock. A very quick question to both uh, Ruhi and Danish. Uh, you know, uh, your book, when I read, I felt that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good book from also the academic perspective uh, to the students of criminal law and also to the practitioners. Uh, as to how uh, the British uh, legal system works and uh, if they happen to, uh, you know, coordinate with the lawyers abroad, what kind of uh, precautions they need to take uh, into consideration. Now, uh, would you like to suggest some steps uh, to our uh, agencies uh, uh, to ensure that there is no bungling up of these cases uh, in the British courts if you know, anyone has to take this up for ex uh, for extradition. Certain <laughs> steps think, that they need to follow, kind of a checklist. Uh, well, I think the entire book ends up being a checklist and we really hope that the agencies do read it, not because it's a book about extradition, but because the book is absolutely factual. It gives you uh, humongous details about all these cases, but also the arguments that have been made in the court. And they're all such different cases with very different arguments. And, uh, you know, the, the consequences of those arguments, the end results have also been very different for each of these cases. So they are sort of a study in themselves, which is what fascinated us uh, when we were doing our research. Just the sheer understanding of how certain arguments played out in the court, uh, what were the clinching arguments that won the cases, what were those little loopholes that probably no one noticed until the case fell through? Uh, so we think it's uh, the book gives you that sort of details to for whether it's law students, whether it's agencies, whether it's anyone who's interested in extradition cases. Um, this is the book that will tell you what worked in the courts and what didn't work in the courts. Or, so, you know, you can actually use a full tight case when you present it in the courts of law and also know the little mistakes that you might make might cost you the case because it has happened in the earlier cases as well so we really do hope uh, that people do benefit out of this book the whole idea was to make sure that this complex process of extradition is written in a way that it's easy to access and easy um, to maybe you know research for the cases that might come up in the future as well. So it is sort of academic, but written with a popular flair rather, it's making it easy for people to read. And just taking forward Ruhi's uh, answer um, here, basically very, very simple things. For example, uh, recording of statement, right? When an agency records someone's statement, if you can do it, do it in front of a magistrate rather than a police officer, because it might not stand up the court's scrutiny. Uh, and then again, understanding what the British courts want. They don't want you, they, they're not going to say that the person is guilty or not guilty. All the courts here want is that you impress them that there is a prima facie case that is made out against that particular person. They don't want narratives. So we had this case of, of, of uh, P. Rajaratinam, who was this very famous takeover tycoon of the 90s, uh, in, who was based in Chennai, who took over a multitude of companies 
And there was a fraud case against him that was brought here in the United Kingdom and the magistrate just threw away the case because they said that uh, the evidence from India is just a narrative of events that this is what he did, this is what he didn't do and that's it. They said, where is the evidence? So very simple, do the homework, uh, have the paperwork in order and also ensure that, that things are not lost in translation. Uh, the other issue that India seems to have had is a huge amount of paperwork, not uh, proper paginations, uh, not putting the points across properly, uh, confusing uh, the, uh, the, the CPS and the judiciary here, because also if there are multiple agencies, they give their inputs and it's quite a task to uh, sort of get them together in a coherent way. And that's what the courts here want. And we speak about all of that in our book, as Ruhi said, because it's a vast area of cases that we look. We also uh, look into great details, the arguments that were made. So uh, we've got a good feedback from the law community uh, already on this. So yes, our book does give a lot of detail about what went wrong and what can go uh, in India's favor. Thank you very much. Mihir, any final words you want to say before we end uh, our conversation? Well, I actually, personally, I really like the book and the way it has been written. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's fascinating. So uh, I, I look forward to many more such books from uh, Ruhi and uh, Danish and uh, wish you all the best uh, in, your, uh, in your future endeavors. And likewise, I'll, I'll, I'll just add that, you know, the book is, is, it's very readable. So, you know, it's not, it's not just an academic text. So, I mean, it's, it's something which is accessible to, you know, to really anyone. You don't have to have a particular background in extradition or on the particular uh, subjects uh, that are related to it, law and such. Uh, so with that, I'd like to end our session today. Many thanks to both Ruhi and, and Danish Khan. Uh, Ruhi, especially thank you for, for appearing in spite of your, uh, in spite of a cough. Uh, as professors, I think both Mihir and I know the difficulty of doing that. Uh, so we really appreciate, uh, you know, you being able to participate uh, regardless. Um, the book um, escaped again. It's, it makes for very timely reading given what's being in the news. Uh, what's been in the news in the, in the past few days. I, I really encourage all of you to take a look at it. Um, and I'll just say as, as a last note, uh, the next event that we'll be having in the series uh, will take place on the 22nd of October, 2021 uh, from seven to 8 p.m. Uh, we'll have Ross Bassett, uh, the author of The Technological Indian, uh, to talk about his book. And his book uh, looks at uh, kind of the longer history of how engineering and science emerged as a, a popular discipline. Uh, in India. So, I mean, you know, many of our students here at SPJMR are uh, products of engineering institutions and then they eventually go on to do MBAs. And uh, Bassett's book really talk, you know, helps explain uh, why there's been so much emphasis on engineering in, in Indian educational, uh, in the Indian educational system. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you again for, for everyone who attended. Uh, thanks again to, to Ruhi and Danish and uh, both Mihira and I, we really enjoyed uh, talking to you. Uh, and uh, we look forward to, to seeing what you work on next. Thank you. Thank you. It's such a pleasure being here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.